I'm happy to, to have here our guests, Professor uh, Pantolini and Massimo Materazzi, and I'm happy that they agreed to give us a seminar to, to our community here in ICPP, but also to our community online. But yeah, I, I can see very, uh, a lot of colleagues uh, connected. So I will uh, start presenting Professor Giuseppe Consolini, who is a senior scientist at the Prophetic National Institute. Ina from 2017. His field of study is space plasma solar telescope physics, in particular complexity and turbulence in space plasma. In 2000, he won the Dr. Giuseppe Borgia Foundation Prize for his studies on the critical nature of magnetospheric dynamics during substorm. And he's lecturer at the University of Torbergata in Rome in plasma physics and advanced statistics, and is author of more than 220. So, Professor Consolini, in this uh, next uh, 30 minutes, will share with us a review of the most re relevant results of the dynamics of the air magnetosphere in terms of a complex system. So, please help me to welcome Professor Giuseppe Consolini. Thank you. thank you, everybody. I would like to thank uh, uh, you to invite me here and to give me the opportunity to present some. Uh, a mini review, let me say, about these things uh, dealing with the complexity and why we need complexity and when we uh, would like to discuss uh, the uh, near Earth plasma dynamics. Now, uh, this is the table of contents of my, my talk. And I would like just to, to start with the lexicon because it is very, um, nece it is necessary just to, as you heard, someone is calling me. <laughs> me. And uh, it is necessary just to fix some uh, uh, words and how we use these words in our context before uh, proceeding in the next uh, uh, discussion. So I will show you some uh, results in the past. Then I would like to discuss some uh, results dealing with the complexity and criticality in emergent state dynamics. And uh, I would like just to present some very recent results that I have, um, we have published uh, uh, very uh, recently, last year. And then I would like just to leave you with some uh, uh, open question dealing with the, uh, this topic. Now, lexicon. So uh, in, the, in my talk, I will use two uh, words. And these words are essentially chaos and criticality. So what's the meaning of chaos and what's the meaning of criticality and how we use this, this terminology? So uh, chaos is something that is typical for a dynamical system when at least one Lyapunov exponent is uh, uh, positive. And uh, it is a, a chaos, so you can observe chaos also in a uh, uh, system dealing with a few degrees of freedom. Okay. Completely different, this is, the, for, for instance, the, the anon map when you can observe chaotic behavior when some parameters uh, uh, overcome some uh, fixed uh, values. And uh, um, conversely, criticality is uh, something that occurs generally in the limit of uh, uh, many degree of freedom, so in the, in the limit of an infinite number of degree of freedom. So this is the, the, the difference. You can find this de definition in a beautiful paper that appears in Jensen, uh, Journal of uh, uh, in general physics of complex, of complex system. And uh, one distinctive feature of the uh, criticality is the emergence of long range correlation. This is typical, for instance, in the case of Ising model or things like this one, where you have essentially a term which is an algebraic term that extends for many orders of magnitude, essentially. Now, uh, the other words that I will use in my presentation is the word complexity. Now, this is a, a very critical word because uh, complexity sometimes assume different meanings depending on the, um, on the field we are using these things. So I have just collected some definition and some, uh, uh, let me say, uh, yes, uh, different meaning of the words of complexity depending on different uh, fields. Now, a complex system is a system which consists of many interacting elements uh, that give rise to an emergent phenomenon. What is an emergent phenomenon? It's something that can be directly surmised from 
the uh, equation dealing with the evolution of the uh, uh, subunits, essentially. Or complexity arises from competition between randomness and order. And this is another, and that uh, another definition, and that the underlying topology of a complex system is uh, inherently related to a certain amount of randomness. Uh, randomness in the interaction, in the network of interaction between the different elements. Another definition from, from Lou uh, is uh, the following one complex systems are formed by many agents interacting with each other. So it's maybe similar to the previous one. But in this case, they he have he used also the, the word nonlinear ways. So nonlinearity is another element of complex system. And uh, summarizing, we could say that uh, a complex system is a system whose phenomenological laws that describe the global behavior of the system are not necessarily directly related to the elemental laws that regulate the evolution of its elementary part. This is fundamental. And this is the, the, uh, the emergent behavior sometimes uh, as, um, let me say, a universal character. So it means that completely different uh, physical systems so systems that are essentially uh, regulated by different uh, kind of uh, microscopic equations, sometimes at a certain uh, level of description, they show a similar behavior, so a universal behavior. Complexity is thus the emergence of non-trivial behavior due to the interaction of subunits that form itself. And uh, let me conclude with the uh, sentence that was uh, um, in, on complex system, on one special feature of complex system from uh, Giorgio Parisi, an interesting feature of complex system is the existence of a large amount of different equilibrium states. So it means uh, metastability in many uh, situations. So now we have just uh, some definitions, and I would like to, to introduce uh, the, the topic of, uh, of my talk. So the the near Earth space is, a, is extremely complex. It's a, a, a region of space which is uh, uh, consists of many different subunits in terms of currents in some of region of plasmas, characterized by different features, and uh, which responds essentially to the to the external driver, so to the uh, let me say to the solar wind, in a, in a, in a way that. Uh, it is not always the same. So we till now we have not a completely understanding of the details of the interaction between the solar wind and this system. Now you can just uh, give a look to this uh, picture. You can see that uh, okay, this is a non-equilibrium system. It, it is in a sometimes in stationary condition, but this is not equilibrium because the magnetic field, uh, the, uh, the geomagnetic field. It tends to be a more or less a depolar uh, uh, structure. So in this case, it's completely asymmetric because the interaction with the solar wind just essentially uh, elongate the system. And uh, also the fact that it's a non-equilibrium is uh, demonstrated by the presence of a large amount of currents. Currents means dissipation. And in terms of uh, uh, pregogene, Dissipation, these are dissipative structures, and these are typical for systems that have to survive outside of equilibrium. Now, the dynamics of this system is extremely complex. So you can see here, for instance, uh, a, a geomagnetic uh, storm, and this is the famous Bastille event that occurs in 2000 which is one of the, the most uh, larger storms that we observed in the, in the last 20 years. And you can see how the response of the system, depending on the latitude and also depending on which kind of uh, currents we are monitoring using this, uh, this geomagnetic indices. So the plasma in this system behaves in completely different ways. The high latitude phenomena are characterized by a very vast dynamics. The, the low latitude show a, a, a more regular behavior, even if this was regular, it's something that we have to, to take care because it's not exactly this one. Now, uh, the study, the, the, uh, let me say, 
Uh, in the past, uh, in the early 90s, uh, there was the first attempt to try to investigate the complex dynamics of, of the uh, magnospheric and let me say also ionospheric plasma um, using uh, uh, a different uh, approach. For instance, uh, one of the most famous uh, uh, paper that appeared, uh, and that was the the first paper, let me say, that demonstrated that there, there is a nonlinear response of the ionosphere to the to the uh, solar wind driver was the paper from Sultan in 1919. And in this paper, it was clearly uh, showed that the, the ratio between the power spectral density of the uh, driver, which is the solar wind, in this case, it is the southward, southward component of the magnetic field, is uh, Essentially, uh, below a certain certain characteristic scale, the dynamics is not one to one. So there is a, a sort of a filtering effect. At the time they are we're talking about uh, a filtering effect. But uh, uh, mostly, uh, one or two years later, essentially one or two years later, they realized that uh, okay, uh, this is not a filtering effect, but uh, the, the, the dynamics of this system, uh, for instance, during the uh, geomagnetic uh, storm, is characterized by, uh, by chaos. And this is one of the first papers by Climas in 1996, where they attempt to reconstruct the attractor, the chaotic attractor, in the case of the EST index. So the essentially is the phase space that they reconstruct using the EST index and a delayed version of this. And they found that uh, Essentially, you can re reconstruct an attractor, which is very similar to some attractor that we have already seen in other, in other situations. However, they realized that we cannot describe all the physics uh, behavior of the system in terms of autonomous uh, uh, system, but we need uh, other models. Now, <laughs> the main problem uh, deals with the fact that, uh, okay, the dynamics, the short time scale dynamics is extremely uh, um, rich, and we are not able with the simple model, analog model, to reproduce the real spectral features. So there should be some more uh, that we are missing when we deal with with the simple models. Simple model means a simple uh, um, equation, essentially uh, dynamical equations relating macroscopic the dynamics of the system. So macroscopic variables. And uh, so there should be much more. And uh, we need to understand, I used to talk about uh, this, the global system, magnetosphere, ionosphere, but because when we deal with, the, for instance, highlight the, the geomagnetic indices, we are including also the effect of the aurora ionosphere. And so we are including also the effect of the plasma in, in, the, in the ionosphere. So uh, they, we realized that, uh, what is the origin of, of this difference? There should be more. It could be, it could come, for instance, from turbulence inside of this medium. Okay. And uh, the point was was the following. Uh, in 1992 and 1996, uh, uh, Richard and Price realized that uh, okay, we should have some stochastic. Uh, Elements in the dynamics of the of the response of this plasma system. They talk about stochastic elements. Later, uh, me and some co-authors uh, demonstrate that uh, the character of the dynamics uh, of of this system is better described in terms of the, of multifractal uh, uh, dynamics. So it means that essentially the energy is this signal is a multifractal signal. And so this means that essentially we have much more degree of freedoms that uh, the uh, degrees of freedom that uh, the, the small set that they put in analog models. So, and uh, the, the dynamics resembles, uh, uh, for instance, the dynamics of a turbulent system. And so this was the element. This is in, in details, this is the, uh, the IA index. This is the, the time derivative of the IA index. You can construct a measure and then you can start the how uh, is distributed the release of the energy in aurora during substance. And you can find that uh, 
this measure is a, uh, is a multifractal measure, which means that you have a lot, a, a lot, a huge amount of singularities essentially in the system. So this is, this behavior has a, a singular character in some sense. Furthermore, we realize that okay, if we take the A index, for instance, and we do a, a local intermittency analysis uh, approach, uh, what this means that we are essentially um, computing the, the wavelength spectrum, and we are extracting only the part of the spectrum that exceeds the Gaussianity condition. So you can expect that if, if you are observing a stochastic noise, you should have just some spotty behavior all over the, the, the frequencies. In this case, we found a coherent structure here. So in space time, you have that the energy increases in a coherent manner. So these are coherent structure, and we call this coherent structure as avalanche. So the character of the dynamics of the magnetospheric energy release during the course of magnetic subsum is characterized by what we call punctuated, punctuated and avalanche dynamics. And, and another important point is that the avalanche does not seem to have a characteristic uh, scale. So you can find very small avalanches here and the biggest one, and they are spreading over, over uh, time and scales. This is scale because frequency in this case corresponds to scales in time scales. Another evidence is the following. Okay, uh, one element that seems to emerge from this uh, analysis in the past was the fact that uh, we have essentially two different kinds of dynamics. A fast dynamics that occurs on time scale smaller than 100 minutes of the plasma, and a long time scale dynamics that occurs on scale longer. Uh, these two dynamics can be, uh, the origin of this uh, can be different. In a, inside the magnetosphere, we have two main processes during a, during a magnetic storm. The announcement of convection that is completely driven by the changes of the condition, the, the south to of the, uh, of, of the magnetic field in interplanetary magnetic field, and also internal energy release that occurs as a reconnection processes, let me say, in the tail region, in the, in the plasma sheet of the tail region. And so one is very fast, and the other one is, is, the, is very, is very uh, um, long in time. And so we can try to separate these two. And we, if we separate these two, we can try to reconstruct a, a what, what is called the state function. Essentially, this is constructed using, for instance, the, the statistics of the long time scale fluctuation and the statistics of the uh, short time scale using a, a Langevin approach. And when we do this, we see that the fast dynamics is a single well. So it means that this is noise in time in, 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 inside a single uh, well structure, while the, uh, the uh, slow dynamics show the formation of a metastable states like this one. So you just push from the driven path on a metastable states, then you stay in that uh, regime, and then you relax energy returning to the, the original configuration. This was something that it was extremely interesting, but also you can see that uh, during the uh, uh, storm, and this was the, uh, the period uh, of the, the larger storm, if you look in time, we see how, for instance, the slow dynamics changes the state function, which means that we are generating a more complex uh, uh, fitness space. If you, if you want, if you if you want to use this term. Now, another properties, as I was saying uh, many times, is the turbulent character. And turbulence say, is, uh, is a common feature that we can find in the, inside the plasma, in uh, both in the magnetosphere and in the ionosphere. This is, for instance, uh, a peculiar phenomena that occurs in the tail region, which is called the um, current disruption. The current disruption is connected with the, the disruption of the cross-state currents in the tail region of the plasma sheet. And, uh, 
the current disrupts and you uh, observe the formation of field aligned currents that tends to, uh, uh, to transport uh, essentially plasma into the aurora regions. And during this phenomenon, you have a depolarization phenomenon because the, the, the tail of the magnetic tail relaxes. Okay. And in this phenomenon, you can see that there, is, there are a huge amount of fluctuations whose features are generally characterized by power low spectra, which uh, are very well in agreement with uh, what is expected in the case of turbulence in many different regimes. This is the spectrum for uh, the current disruption. This is uh, below the the ion cyclotron frequency. Above, you have a, a, a minus five third or minus one. This is the spectra that you observe in the CASP. This is the spectra that you observe in the case of uh, uh, electric field uh, in the aurora region by cro as crossed by uh, uh, CSIS satellites. So you have different uh, situation, but uh, you have still let me say the emergence of forward scaling for the fluctuations over a wide range of scales. In this case, these are more than two orders of magnitude. Then you have more than nearly four orders of magnitude. Here you have, it, I, we cannot go in this part because the, the, the time interval is short, but uh, so turbulence is something that is essentially a uh, constitutive elements of the dynamics of uh, both the ionospheric and magnetospheric plasmas. Now, let me move to another uh, uh, argument complex. Uh, in the early 90s, Tom Chang suggested that, uh, okay, the dynamics of, of the, this uh, complex system is uh, better described by an infinite dimensional nonlinear system near the critical. So what do, does it mean? It means that we should observe a sort of scale invariant processes in the energy relaxation. So later, there were some studies. Originally, I think this connected uh, uh, with the with Tom Chang view, where we attempt essentially to study what the, the similarities between the so-called self-organized critical system and and the um, uh, dynamics of the of the Earth's magnetic sphere. Now, uh, one of the first evidence of the uh, existence of uh, uh, scale invariance in the energy release was done just by studying the the bust sides of the um, uh, I index. In terms of, uh, I would like to remind that the I index is a, me is a measure of the rate of the energy deposition in the rural region. And uh, you can connect the, the direct with this I index with, uh, with the, the energy that is released du uh, during the uh, magnospheric Samson. And so essentially, by studying the distribution function of uh, this bus by integrating, so bus by bus, what it was found is that essentially you can recover a power law distribution over nearly three and a half orders of magnitude. So what does it mean? It means that you don't have a characteristic energy for the, ener for the release of this uh, um, energy, for, for the release of the energy from the tail regions. One of the models that was, was proposed at the time was the drip, drip the faucet, faucet model. Essentially, you are imagining like the, the, the drops, uh, drops of water that are more or less regular with the Gaussian distribution. In this case, it, we are com in a completely different uh, situations. So we have not a characteristic scale. We have uh, like in the, the earthquakes, a huge amount of small uh, bursting, bus dynamics, energy release, and sometimes a very large one, till the system-wide one. And also by comparing the results of, of the spectral features of, uh, of uh, uh, index with the, with the simulations from the from uh, 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 the Senpai models, uh, Vankardar Senpai models, we, we found that the, there was a, a, a very similar behavior. So the, this was one indication that uh, perhaps the, 
the energy release during the magnetic spheric sandstorm is a scale invariant process. Uh, this evidence was later corroborated by other measurements. For instance, uh, Angelopoulos in 1999 uh, found that the scale invariant uh, probability distribution function for the vast bulk flows in the tail region. So it means that essentially the reconnection process that occurs in that region is not a massive one, but it's just a spotty dynamics, okay, with many reconnecting sites. And where the energy release depends on the structure that you are reconnecting, the magnetic structure that you are reconnecting. Later, also Louis uh, and Codos found that the spatial energy distribution and side distribution of aurora distinct uh, luminosity and the Uriski space time features of aurora blobs. All these features are characterized by scale invariance. And so the existence of scale invariance in this uh, uh, different phenomena suggested that the uh, dynamics of the plasma inside uh, the magnetospheric and also ionospheric region can be related with uh, the dynamics of an outer equilibrium system near a, a critical point. And they call force them on self-organized criticality. This uh, uh, name was coined by Tom Chang in order to consider that, uh, okay, we have a driving, an external driving, so a certain amount of uh, tuning effect could be, could exist in this situation. These are some other results. Uh, for instance, by studying the aurora blobs, in, as observed by polar UVI images in the ultraviolet, they can reconstruct the energy deposited in, in every single blobs. And when they do the distribution function, they found this a nearly polar distribution function covering nearly six orders of magnitude. So this was really impressive. This is another example that essentially means that, okay, this is for a rural index, uh, uh, index. This is what occurs in um, uh, magnetic storms. So for the low latitude geomagnetic index. So the, the, the behavior is similar. Now, what is the origin of this uh, scale invariant uh, behavior? Uh, now, Freeman in 2000 uh, anyway said, okay, but they can find similar results in turbulent medium uh, as the solar wind. So what we are observing is essentially the same behavior that you uh, have outside. But the, the situation is not so simple. Because uh, if you look to the timing of these events, these are not correlated one one. So it means that, okay, the behavior could be similar, but uh, we have different timing. Another point is this one. Essentially, if we look to, to the uh, distribution of two quantity, which is the size, and the, uh, if I remember the uh, duration, you can find that you have a spreading here in this area for the small scale, while for the large scale, you have a, a correlation. And so, um, no, this is the, the outside, sorry. This is the energy that is uh, uh, driven inside the, the, the magnetosphere via the uh, perot of function. So the difference is essentially that, okay, the, here there is not a clear correlation. The correlation is only for the very large events when you have a massive transfer of energy. In that kind, in that situation, the convection is the main phenomenon that drives all the magnetosphere. Another uh, evidence of this double tensure is uh, uh, just this one. Using wavelet and uh, local intermittency measure, we can separate the spotty dynamics from the, the directly driven. You can see here the relationship between this signal, which is the uh, index uh, common, okay, so the mean behavior that we extracted by removing the spotty dynamics and the BB sound. So this is the convection, while this is, this is the internal dynamics. So we have completely different uh, aspects. And this is extremely important because if you want to make a, a prediction, a forecasting for a space weather event, we have to join 
this information, but we have to know the internal dynamics. And this is something that uh, at the moment uh, we are not able to reproduce very well. So uh, essentially we have these two processes and uh, the internal dynamics uh, is uh, characterized by these uh, scale invariant uh, features. However, as usual, these results uh, were um, clearly um, discussed uh, uh, with other results, uh, like the one that were found by Sitnov, Sharma, and Papadopoulos, uh, uh, where they say, okay, during the subsum, you can recover, you can find a general shape. You have the expansion, the recovery, and the growth, like a, a complex uh, manifold, along a complex manifold. And so you can see here the flow, which is the expansion phase, then you go up, and then you have the transition at the onset here, which is just the jump from, from this manifold, which is not just a flat, but is a, is a complex manifold. And, and they say, okay, so the global, we have also um, uh, global low dimensional uh, uh, dynamics that is uh, uh, observed both in, in Samson and in storms. And uh, in terms of the uh, transition uh, theory, uh, this is a first order transition. While uh, uh, there are some features like the previous that I've shown you before, so this one, which seems to be and also this, related with the second order phase transition. So we have two processes that are joining during uh, Samsung. And uh, Another step was done later, just to understand if uh, we can extract these two features. So we use a different approach. We extract the complex dynamics, and we found that, uh, okay, this seems to be uh, something that is related with extreme statistics. This is the, the, the distribution function, the Frechet distribution function, which is something that uh, is, uh, um, generally is used to characterize extreme event statistics. So what we can conclude from this analysis, okay, we have two different processes inside the material sphere. The fast dynamics, which is completely controlled by the plasma features and the uh, uh, reconnection process occurring in the, in the central plasma sheet of the tail region, and uh, which is characterized by scale invariance and that we can treat in terms of extreme event statistics. And then we have the, the driven part, which is the, the one that we are able at a certain level to uh, forecast using the external uh, driver. So using the solar wind condition, we can reconstruct quite well a certain part of the external dynamics, but we have, we missed the, the fast, the fast fluctuations. And the, the fast fluctuation is still important because for instance, if you want to predict the effects like the one that are related with the geomagnetic uh, um, induced currents, you need to, to predict very well the, the transient because it, it, this is related with, the, with the, uh, the, the current that you can induce in the system. And so in terms of, uh, of prediction of forecasting is extremely important. Uh, to, to, to get information about this dynamics. So we can conclude this uh, part by saying that neither self-organized legality nor self-organization model taken separately uh, can explain the whole variety of the dynamic of the atmospheric activity on certain on substance scales. I would like to, to say that essentially the complex dynamics of these systems is uh, the results of competing processes uh, between uh, dissipation and uh, fluctuating forces. The fluctuating forces is the driver, dissipation is the process occurring inside. And now let me move to the uh, recent results. Uh, what we have done, okay, in the early 2000s, some people tried to, uh, to model the dynamics of uh, uh, plasma, Magnospheric plasma in terms of geomagnetic indices, because these are the quantities how we can observe the global feature. The problem is that we, we are still now we have not uh, enough measurements uh, to like, uh, uh, let me say, images 
of the plasma conditions inside the magnosphere. We have some spotty measurements. Uh, while uh, uh, the global dynamics can be essentially monitored using geomagnetic images with a certain level. So um, they said, okay, we would like to, uh, to model, uh, for instance, a index using a stochastic dynamical process uh, using a, a Langevin equation. And the first attempts were done by NAT. And they tried to predict the fluctuation, so the, the fluctuations. And uh, uh, later, Purkinen uh, uh, um, tried to predict the, 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 the dynamics itself of the index and not of the fluctuating part. Uh, the idea is that, OK, we can compute the, the, the drift and the diffusion term. They use uh, this very simple uh, expression. And they computed the dependence of the drift and the diffusion term from the value of the index. And, but this was the, the prediction. So again, the results are very good. This is IAE uh, real, and this is the modeling of AE. Uh, we are not convinced that this is enough. And why? Uh, because uh, uh, we believe that there should be something more. And uh, uh, we try to essentially to see if, uh, to verify if we can model these things using a, a simple Langevin equation, using a drift, drift diffusion equation, essentially, stochastic drift diffusion equation. But to, to see this, we need to essentially verify uh, the condition uh, the, the, on, on the kramers moyal um, uh, coefficients to see if we can stop our modeling just to get the evolution of, of the system in the uh, using just uh, the, the first two uh, two main coefficients, so the drift and the diffusion coefficient. So the first thing that we have done is just to to taste the um, the Chapman Kolmogorov equation, the agreement between the uh, uh, the, uh, the the results of the observation and the one that we can construct a certain scale applying the chapman kolmogorov equation. Later, we need to verify that the four order kramers moyal coefficient is zero. Because if the uh, uh, four order kramers moyal coefficient is zero, we can uh, essentially apply uh, the um, Pabula theorem so that uh, we can reduce all our uh, description in terms of the diffusion process. But, uh, okay, looking at uh, the, uh, the, the D1, D2, and D4, we notice that D4 is not zero. So we cannot truncate the expansion for the for the um, focal plant equation in terms of focal plant operator. And so we, we have just to uh, consider that uh, uh, also terms of higher than four. So the drift diffusion equation is not a good approximation. Such. And so if we do this, uh, a best description should be done in terms of uh, um, uh, diffusion that contains also Poissonian jump. So you have a drift diffusion equation, but you have some jumps that they can be related to the, to the busty dynamics. And uh, this is an example of the uh, real index, the model one, and the characteristic of the power spectral features that are very similar. Now we are confident that uh, we have to include also uh, this busty dynamic uh, using Poisson jump process. And so this means essentially the dynamics of this uh, 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 system is, uh, is a complex dynamics consisting of many processes interacting with each other. And uh, 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 this jump process can be related with the, the, the sporadic plasma enhancement and energy release in the central plasma sheet. And so these are the conclusions. So essentially what in this very uh, brief uh, uh, review, I have shown you that uh, there are many features 
for the hemispheric and ionospheric plasma dynamics, which are the nonlinear dynamics, punctuate the equilibrium, scale invariance, avalanche feature, non equilibrium first and second order phase transition, fast and slow dynamics, Markovian character that can be bonded via a jump diffusion stochastic dynamics. So um, I think that uh, we, have the, we have not to, to forget that we are dealing with an open system. So in open system, uh, the situation is, is can, we cannot relate with the equilibrium system near or closed equilibrium system or uh, closed uh, dynamics in closed system. And so the fluctuation forces uh, are sometimes uh, separated from, from, the, 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 from those producing the dissipation. And so this is something that uh, can be the origin of this uh, very complex behavior. And now we, we still have some uh, open question. Uh, and I think that these are the, the, the very uh, critical issue that we would like to discuss in the future. So uh, in order to model, to forecast the, the overall dynamics of this uh, plasma system, we need to essentially to, um, to identify the best set of variables because most of these studies have been done using geomagnetic indices or by observing the fluctuation of magnetic field and other velocity field and other plasma dynamics locally, but not globally. Another point is, uh, is uh, we would need to construct a real uh, fitness landscape. So how we can construct from this the landscape, so the, the, if, you, if you want to say the phase space, but this is not the phase space, landscape of the minima of the systems and how the system evolves in this uh, complex landscape. I have in mind something that reminds a uh, uh, landscape, which is a complex in sense. You have a, a, a grand minima, but then you can have many other local minima, like a hierarchy of metastable states. And uh, the last one is the, what are the relevant control parameters? Because we are the, uh, the control parameters, so the condition outside of, of, of the solar, the, of the Magnosphere, so the interplanetary medium. Uh, what these are extremely relevant. So, what are the best uh, control parameters that uh, can uh, be used to understand and uh, model the different scale invariant features that we can find? So, let me say that I would like to to thank uh, Jenka and Bruno for inviting me, and uh, thank you for uh, for your attention. So, this is this is the. Thank you very much, Stepe. Uh, we have time for one short question. Um, the participants online were already invited to write down the questions if they have. If not, we can also wait at the end to see if we have time for questions for Stepe. Let me check in the room if we have any short questions. You usually do a question on the work that we have done together. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, I have only one question. If you, if you don't mind to uh, come back to slide seven. Seven. I'm just curious about the. So, um, it's uh, one of the very first. Very precise. No, no, I'm curious about the, um, the trajectory of this. This is DST, right? It's so, this is a subrogate of uh -huh, DST. Okay. Is okay. We can do the same with BST. We are attempting to do this. Yes. Um, is a, is a reconstruction of BST using an analog model. But uh, even if you're using this analog model, which is essentially a um, uh, dynamical system equation, you have the, the evolution of BST that is related with the, uh, a driving term and the dissipation term. Essentially, you have these two elements, very simple. You can reconstruct also a, a dynamics that, depending on, on the changing of the condi external condition, generates uh, um, an attractor. But the same can be observed with DST. I, I noticed that I've written DST, but I forget to write uh, uh, the survey. Yeah, the D. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But it can be considered a strange attractor? Or it or was it? demonstrated that uh, we are in presence of a strange attractor. Uh, whose dimensionality is a near three because they reconstructed the phase space and they noticed that the correlation dimension that you can 
uh, uh, compute by this is essentially a number intermediate about 2.5 2.7 and so this means that uh, uh, the the phase the motion occurs on on a, a fractal structure in the phase space uh, the attractor and then when you observe you, you have a fractality this means that this is a strange attractor and so the behavior is chaotic because it was demonstrated that in the case of chaos you have strange attractor Okay, so let's find again this yeah. And uh, okay, you don't mind, Massimo, to hold your presentation while I'm continuing. Yeah. Are you able to do it? Yeah. Let's try. Sure. Um, okay, so let's move to our second FBI seminar talk. So I, I have the pleasure to present uh, to introduce you, Dr. Massimo Matelassi. Uh, he took his PhD review in theoretical physics in 2000, working on quantum coaching radiation. In the same year, he joined the CNR group, Biomedical Variability, CNR is a very expert uh, national research center here in Italy. Um, and in 2004, he entered the Institute for Complex Physics. In Being involved in turbulence and plasma irregularity. In 2009, he started to work on metriplex formally. Yeah, I think he will explain what this means. What this means? <laughs> yes, of course. And since 2014, he has been cooperating with biologists in the object well model. So he will present also some formalist useful for complex dynamical systems. Yes. And some application examples. Which is talking title 1001 dynamics, not that the uh, new second law was in Thank you, Massimo. I thank you, Jennifer. I, think, uh, I want also to mention and thank very much both Bruno Nava and Sandro Ravicella, uh, more than other than Jenka, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity of speaking to the audience here and uh, uh, connected from from away. So um, my my key point, the key point of this uh, of this presentation is a very short, uh, I wouldn't say review, but rather tasting, spotty tasting of uh, uh, dynamics. Uh, of course, I will not bother you with uh, thousand and one dynamics, where dynamics, I mean uh, a dynamical system, so a set of uh, variables describing a physical system and the equations describing the motion of these variables that we think are enough to describe the system. The, the comment, not that F equals M times A was not enough, uh, underlines that to my, to my understanding, uh, complexity is not, and the many dynamics from complexity, that we may find from complexity don't change the basic laws of physics that we are aware of, uh, like uh, the beautiful laws that uh, Stella has written on her on her shirt <laughs> with the general with the general quantum <laughs> theory um, Lagrangian. Uh, but consider that all those laws were obtained uh, focusing mainly on singular particles on single particles, on very few degrees of freedom systems, OK? And now what we have to do is taking many, many systems undergoing the fundamental laws and put them together to get what is finally actually complexity. So these are the contents of the, of the presentation. I will define complexity as a property of many uh, composite systems. On a, on a one hand, I would say that complexity, in a sense, doesn't exist, as anomalies don't exist, because everything is complex. The non-complex things are the exception and not the, and not the general rule. I will give three examples that are conflict of interest, because these are the things in which I work. So turbulent media, as an example of complexity, uh, that is in situations of high local gradients or long distance interactions, the parcels of fluid organize themselves in uh, structures that are singular and coherent, those structures Giuseppe Consolini was speaking about, and this is 
uh, this requires for uh, beyond smooth treatment, that is the treatment of these media are, is better done with uh, uh, variables that are not everywhere differentiable, that are not everywhere deterministic or smooth. I will um, speak about uh, this metriplectic formalism, another subject, about dissipation. Dissipation, like mechanical friction, that transfers the energy from macroscopic degrees of freedom uh, to microscopic, very small scale degrees of freedom, while in the case of turbulence, the, trans the energy transfer takes place uh, between nearby scales, mainly. Okay, and last but not least, I will invite you to uh, peep into the world of uh, uh, quantitative life science, speaking about networks of interactions that describe trophic webs, that is schemes, network-like schemes describing um, ecosystems conceived like uh, unique uh, whole things described by the many, uh, very many variables necessary for those uh, to be described. So what is complexity? Complexity, uh, okay. Complexity is what happens when ma the many uh, or even few actually constituents of the composite system uh, interact in such an important way that the collective behavior of the system results more than, the, than from the single characteristics of the uh, single uh, components, from the characteristics of interactions among these components. Here, I give you the example of the exceptional non-complex composite system, that is the Maxwell gas, a model in which a gas is represented as the collection of small uh, particles, rigid, uh, bending on the, uh, on the other, uh, meeting, uh, interacting only when they meet each other, uh, with point-like interactions, and in that case, the non-complex case, the behavior and the thermodynamics of the whole system may be rather easily inferred from the properties and the expression of the energy of the single particle, because the interactions are point-like. They almost don't exist. They almost never exist. In case of much more properly complex, and in this case, non-complex systems, I can say, you know what they do, they, the subsystems, as isolated ones, you know what they do together. That's it. Instead, in complex, properly complex systems like colloidal systems, particles interact with long range interaction. They sense each other even from afar. And what happens is that this determines the emergence of mesoscale structures, that is aggregates of subsystems, like this mimicked here and there, in which that they have a scale that interpolates between the scale of the microscopic uh, component and the scale of the whole system. Now, this uh, produces a hierarchy of aggregates between the single particle and the whole system scales, giving rise to uh, behavior that is not predictable a priori, if you ignore interactions, like in, in, instead in the case of Maxwell gas. So what one may say now is, you know what they do as isolated ones, you make them interact and everything changes. And this is the essence of complexity, the emergence of things that you couldn't expect if you didn't take into account the interactions. So the first example of complexity is turbulence that has been longly treated by, by Consolini. Uh, turbulence organizes the free devolution so that there are these features. Multi-scale coherent structures may be distinguished. There is groups of subsystems organized uh, going together, forming coherent structures. And this happens on many scales, like vortices in the classical um, turbulent theories. The local quantities, and this is very important, like velocity, density, kinetic energy, or dissipation in, in non-ideal fluids, show mathematically irregular behavior. If you describe them uh, with, with local uh, quantities, these are non-differentiable almost everywhere. They have spikes. They are really wide, like these uh, 
um, like these uh, plots I have reported of the velocity of the solar wind and of the temperature of it from this beautiful review of Bruno and Carbon. And uh, the time series and space profiles appear er, as intermittent noisy signal. It is clear here that I am speaking about noise in a possibly improper way for some one of you. Uh, actually, for me, noise is something probabilistic, okay? Not necessarily Gaussian, not necessarily wide, not necessarily uncorrelated, okay? Uh, so what we introduce, first of all, is the so-called stochastic approach. Uh, that is, I try to describe the system via equations in which I uh, try to consider the nature, the probabilistic nature of fluctuations directly putting in the equations some uh, noise, probabilistic terms. These are basically works that I have been doing together with Consolini. Uh, SFT stays for stochastic theory. So you turn all the um, fluid equations and plasma equations into stochastic field theories. That is local descriptions in which um, noises appear. What are noises in this case? Okay. For instance, this is uh, visco, uh, visco, uh, visco resistive MHD, okay, written in suitably uh, annoying formalism with all the indices of uh, SO3 group. Okay, basically, these quantities here, like uh, um, ohm low, uh, the ratio between current and uh, um, matter density and the ratio between the gradient of the pressure and matter density are considered so wide, so irregular, to be better represented by noise. So the MHD equations become Langevin field equations, that is field equations in which noise, in which probabilistic terms like this, this, and that appear. The same thing can be done, and we have done it lately, uh, for uh, um, equations in which uh, instead of the local uh, velocity and, and, uh, and uh, magnetic field of MHD, we used their gradients to stress the topological nature of the structures that we find. Besides this, what I want to say is that if you have a system with noises in its equations, what happens is that you don't have the initial condition problem like uh, uh, the Newton problem with initial condition well defined and then the forces given for all the times uh, later. You have terms, forces, kicks that continuously time by time throw the dice, so to speak. So we'll, you will not have a system living only one life, but statistically speaking, leaving many, many, um, let's say, histories together, each weight with a, a different statistical weight probability to take place depending on the shape of the dynamics that you have put there. Precisely like, like uh, when Feynman introduced his graphs, the path integral, so this, the history and the probability to, to behave like this or like that of, of uh, this kind of fluids, that are the turbulent fluids actually, uh, is just calculated via um, path integrals. What do I mean? Okay, for instance, this is a system that many of you may know, the so-called uh, equatorial, uh, let's say, turbulence in the, given by the E cross B uh, effect in the ionosphere. You have an interplay, I will not go into the detail because uh, it is not possible to explain it shortly for those who doesn't know, who don't know, and for those who already know it, uh, it is simply annoying. But however, it is an interplay between the geomagnetic field and the geoelectric field and the velocity of the plasma, so that at the equator, the plasma of the ionosphere is pulled up by this uh, combination. And just like a fountain, when it falls down, uh, it simply makes uh, turbulent irregularities. Uh, on the on the top of the photon, of the plasma photon, just because of the interplay electric, magnetic, and gravitational. Now, what happens is that 
typically in your simulations, you assume that there are some seeding, so to speak, at the beginning. So you say the ionosphere has some irregularities here and there. Let's see how the nonlinear uh, evolution develops those irregularities. Here, the idea is very different. You consider that uh, actually the equations of motion of fluctuations that is represented here, this uh, big object, I am not going into details, however, it is a little bit uh, big. With these uh, quantities R and Xi uh, here, that are basically related to gradients, either space or time gradients of local quantities. And they are understood as widely uh, fluctuating. So they are noises. If they are noises, uh, the, the, the system will develop in a probabilistic way. In order to calculate the probability, so you can define a probability to go between the time, initial time and final time from an initial ionospheric configuration into a final given ionospheric configuration, this depends on how the deterministic dynamics couples with noise between the initial and final time. And you can calculate this kind of uh, path integral that is uh, very complicated. And we didn't, I didn't dare to put the calculations until the end, but basically what I want to know is that as in quantum mechanics, you once you accept the presence of probability in the turbulence, as in quantum mechanics, you throw your reactants into the accelerator and you say, okay, this is the initial condition. I give the final, uh, let's say, products. I want to see, and I calculate it through a path integral, what is the probability to go from here to there, from this configuration to this final other configuration in this time, the same thing can be done for a turbulent fluid, for an irregular fluid. I start from a given condition, initial condition. I want to see whether, for instance, uh, two polarity of uh, magnetic field will reconnect or not, and such thing. And I can calculate it in principle via a um, path integral, which is one of the most complicated thing I know in mathematical physics. In turbulence, this has already been uh, told by Giuseppe, so I will be very fast on this. Uh, Multifractal and fractals appear. Basically, what we discovered that domains of physical interest uh, may be uh, may, may, may be not space filling, that is not having a dimension like three or two, that is an integer dimension, but be rather uh, domains which are self-similar and have a real, that is non-integer, Hausdorff dimension. For instance, in the multifractal formalism, you collect the, let's say, demography of uh, the degree of casts that you find in your turbulent sigma, saying that a given uh, property of the cusp, like going like this, for instance, is present in the locus of the points that has, for instance, dimension, Hausdorff dimension 0 0.4, while another non cusp, in this case, regular behavior, is present in the locus of points. Uh, which dimension is 0 0.6. So it is a collection of singularities and the population of singularities, different singularities have non-integer dimension and are non-space filling domains. What you discover is that fractals are not only beautiful, bizarre and nice, but may be useful to try understanding uh, phenomena like in space plasma, like fast reconnection, that is a dependence of reconnect magnetic reconnection rate, which is faster with respect to the Lundqvist number Rm, the magnetic Reynolds number, than what is predicted by the traditional Sweet Parker mechanism. So if you assume that the locus of points 
in which magnetic reconnection takes place is not space filling, but rather a fractal dust of, let's say, dimension D, the dependence on the past of the magnetic reconnection rate on this uh, uh, Reynolds number uh, is faster than what happens if you assumed that the space, that the space in which reconnection takes place is space field. Okay? So you observe actually something like this in nature, you can't explain it without assuming that there is, okay, you are, it is difficult to explain it. One attempt could be assuming that the place where this reconnection takes place is a dust of suitable uh, dimension. Okay, the second, how many minutes do I have? Yes. And more. Okay, so I will be <laughs> I will be very fast on this point because I wanted to speak about a little bit uh, uh, on trophic webs. Okay, so this is simply another way of uh, describing the dissipative systems that are systems with uh, dissipation, breaking the beautiful uh, Hamiltonian formalism that has the great good property of algebraizing. Uh, the uh, basically the dynamics. Okay, I'll just come to the to the conclusion here. There exists a metriplectic formalism, which is a formalism extending the pure uh, Hamiltonian part of the motion via a, via a part in which you have the combination between a symmetric, semi-metric matrix G and the gradient of the entropy of those microscopic degrees of freedom through which dissipation transfers energy. And this is equivalent to creating, let's say, a non-unitary motion in quantum, uh, in quantum theory. The basic thing is that this algebraic uh, scheme allows you to study uh, systems like uh, thermodynamic systems in which the energy is conserved while entropy grows. Okay, these are the systems to which the um, metriplectic system has been applied. Okay, let's go to discuss a little bit about trophic webs. A trophic web is uh, the evolution, the cultural evolution of a trophic chain. When we of, uh, of a food chain. When we were children, we were told that uh, there is the grass that is eaten by the herbivore, that is eaten by the small carnivore, that is eaten by the large carnivore in a chain. Now we have understood, of course, that uh, systems, ecological systems, work more, much more like networks of relationships instead of chains. So, Trophic webs are networks that represent the interaction among the different species inhabiting a given environment and having ecological relationships like predation, competition, cooperation, and so on. The beautiful thing, the, the, the nice thing of trophic webs is that they describe the environment not taking care only about the evolution of the single species, but focusing on the interactions among them so that the dynamical variable of the describing a network or a trophic web describes the whole state of the system. So I will uh, tell you about two trophic webs on which I have been working. That is the competition between two algae, two different algae species, so to speak, that are grazed by sea urchins and that are grazed in different things in different ways, I'm sorry, between uh, the two different species of algae. And the uh, phenomenon of kleptoparasitism of wild boar on wolves. Now, what does this have to do with all the plasma physics that we have been speaking about? Actually, these are uh, manifestations of complexity because as we are going to see, the phenomena that we have been taking care of in order to write the equations of these trophic webs are basically 
due to the interaction, not only between the species, but also between, I'm sorry, among the different individuals of a given species. In a food chain, you have a wolf that kills a roe deer, it's a roe deer and that's it, meets a, a wild boar, if he's fit enough, it's the wild boar and that's it. So interactions like the Maxwell particles in a sense. In a trophic web, with this uh, uh, phenomena described as I'm going to show you if I have time, basically the interactions depend on the number of the individuals, the nature itself of the interaction depends on the number of the individuals of the two different species, in a sense, enhancing the fact, stressing the fact that, uh, how to say, pores may be made by union. So if the ratio between one species competing to the other is of a certain nature, then a certain behavior instead of standard behavior appears. So, okay, this is the competition between the Chistoseira, which is an arborescent alga, and uh, uh, turf, which is a meta community of, in of invasive smaller macroalgae that may take profit of the disappearance of uh, Chistoseira. Okay, and both these algae are eaten by uh, sea urchins, like, uh, and they compete among each other. So both algae have the same grazer, but they interfere with each other. So these are the things that one has to take into account to write the equations I'm gonna show you. So first of all, as recruitment, you have an alga that uh, propagates its uh, uh, seeds, so to speak, in the diffuses its seeds in the environment. Now, what happens is that in the case of Chistoseira, if the propagule falls, this, this object here, if the seed falls outside the canopy, then it survives. While if it falls inside the canopy, the shadowing of adult algae may kill it. So what happens is that the recruitment of the population does not depend on the fit, on the nature, on the behavior of the single individual, but by the presence of the whole uh, group. The same thing happens to the propagules of the turf, with the difference that uh, propagules of the turf may be brought by the current of the sea, so they can come from afar. Not only um, the Propagules of Chistoseira don't uh, survive instead inside a turf, while turf may survive as epiphyte or as, let's say, undergrowth, like here, in the canopy of Chistoseira. Last but least, there is a big difference between the uh, grazing of sea urchins on the turf algae that are small, uh, like a carpet, and maybe. Uh, grazed all over the place, while Chistoseira are like big trees for the sea urchins, and they rarely dare to enter, rarely manage to enter the canopy, but simply eat the border of the canopy. This and uh, the one on the top mean that actually there are relationships like the predation, so to speak, of sea, of sea urchins on Chistoseira and the uh, reproduction of uh, uh, Chistoseira itself that only take place on precisely topo precise topological, topologically precise places, that is the border of the place where this alga is. And this will affect deeply the form of the equations. These are the form of the equations. Those who uh, among you have a little bit of familiarity with the trophic webs and uh, interactions among species may recognize that, uh, for instance, Chistoseira basically has uh, a free term that is like the uh, logistic equation. So this tends to saturate at, at a certain um, maximum carrying capacity that is sustainable by the environment, but it behaves like not only the population C, acts, but only the square root of it, just to mimic the fact that only the border individuals 
due to this complex behavior of interference among individuals of the same species survive. I will not uh, touch very much the other, the other terms, uh, not to be boring, but however, basically, for instance, here, the presence of this square root here, instead of uh, the first power like here, mean that the sea urchins may eat only, only the border of the group of the sea urchin may interact with the border of the group of Chistoseira, while here all the sea urchins and all the individuals of turf may interact with each other, precisely because here we are speaking about the border interaction and here we are speaking about just a, a mass interaction. Okay, I don't, okay, I will skip the, the last part because I don't think I have time, but however, such a complex system here may be studied in terms of uh, um, bifurcation, for instance, varying this uh, parameter, uh, that is the mortality of sea urchins, and you may see that there is extinction if you increase these this, this sea urchins, of the sea archin mortality of Chistoseira and turf and sea archin themselves, what happens is that there are uh, scenarios where these ex get, gets extinct, they survive, scenarios in which there are oscillations and scenarios in which there are other fixed points like these here with respect to the small to the small uh, delta U uh, regime. This means not only that the system may be uh, fit to represent different ecological scenarios, but also that very okay, so this is a very rich dynamical system, but that maybe can be used to uh, make some kind of management, uh, adaptive management of the environment. Okay, I will skip the last example of Wildboar and thank you very much for having been able to run after me uh, or simply follow me or look at me, let's see, at, at least uh, all over the seminar. Thank you very much. I'm sorry? That was five minutes. Uh, okay. So we have 10 minutes for questions. Zoom or online. Can you check online? Okay, I will check. Ah, okay, please go ahead. I don't know if you could take a few minutes just to summarize the work we are doing. Uh, okay, okay, okay. okay. I don't have the presentation on this computer, but however, because it would be a repetition. However, since uh, 2019, I have had the great pleasure to interact with Professor Ricella and uh, Jenka about uh, a crazy but beautiful project, a donkey shop like project, so to speak, a project of research. I'm not speaking about the management, okay? Uh, to answer these uh, basic questions, that is how predictable the ionosphere, the local ionosphere is. So the idea basically, because this is a very important question, both on the applicative and theoretical point of view, and uh, the basic idea that we had uh, and has made me push, for instance, uh, the ICTP group and uh, Giuseppe Consolini's group to meet and to start working together, uh, is that we can, we, we have to understand the dynamics of the ionosphere from another perspective, probably, with respect to what traditionally is done, uh, importing in the dynamics of the ionosphere, the tools and the ideas of complexity and dynamical systems. In particular, we have started in practice Sorry to say we had to wait for the end of the, of the pandemia because uh, it was not easy to work uh, and we all had other, other pains and problems. But however, what, what has come to as a very beautiful gift 
that we gave, that we made ourselves, is the starting to study a proxy, a very commonly used proxy of the ionosphere, of the local ionosphere state, that is the vertical total electron content, time series of this quantity, uh, analyzed as the, let's say, proxy of a dynamical system of which one wants to reconstruct both, uh, let's say, the dynamics, at least from a geometrical point of view. So first of all, to reconstruct the number of dynamical variables necessary to describe the system, the evolution of which gives rise this proxy via the embedding procedure going from the one dimensional time series of the vertical total electron content to a, in the case we have been studying, three dimensional phase space or motion space, let's say, in through which a representative system uh, let's say, uh, encoding the, the local ionospheric dynamics uh, should move in order to produce the PCVC. And uh, not only this uh, space is reconstructed, but also the uh, Hausdorff dimension of the possibly strange attractor along which the system moves, and the, um, let's say, degree of uh, self uh, ignorance, let's say, cancellation of information that the complex system uh, produces instant by instant, that is uh, more properly say, like Kolmogorov entropy rate, and its inverse that is basically the time horizon of the age. So uh, what else? I think that this is a very beautiful, of course I like it, otherwise I wouldn't participate clearly, but this is on the propaganda. What I can say is that this is uh, a very important attempt to uh, import uh, this kind of uh, mathematical physical culture into the ionosphere and the uh, space weather. Not that we were the first ones to do it, definitely. Not that we are possibly the best ones to do it, definitely. But however, we are trying to. And, uh, it is my pleasure and honor to say that one of the most important, let's say, reference for a university community in Italy, that is ICTP uh, Radicella's group, former Radicella's group, is uh, interested in this, in this uh, adventure. Okay, we have an interesting question in the chat. Okay. I, I will read it for you. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Fabio Guedes. Hi, Fabio. Thanks for coming in online. He says, thank you for your presentation. You mentioned the E-cross-D drift as an example of complex structure. Hey, sorry? E-cross-D drift. Yes. It's an yes, example yes. of complex structure as equatorial plasma. Yeah. Is there any sense to use the Dorothy West approach to many geophysical phenomena like the formation of plasma irregularities, or is this useful only to ecological? Scenarios. So thank you very much, Fabio. Where should I look at Fabio over there, possibly? I think that uh, actually trophic webs are a graphical way to represent any kind of interacting, not trivially interacting variables. Okay. So if you have, uh, I don't know, sorry, I cannot. If you have some vector like this, okay. So you have a vector and dynamics, uh, each that's like, uh, like uh, I don't know, x k, that is uh, a function of x1, x a k itself, x n. You have many variables interacting among each other, each depending from the other. This may be represented as a tropic web, in a sense, or as a network. So. May these variables be species of animals, plants, uh, or uh, whatever you want, or physical, dynamical variables like currents, fields, and pressures, or whatever. Basically, they, they work in the same way. For instance, there is a beautiful uh, model of, uh, ion, of uh, magnetospheric currents that is the wind me. I don't know how updated and how modern teaser dates back uh, many years ago in the 90s 
Basically, this model represents the magnetosphere, correct me if I'm wrong, like a complicated circuit, regular um, electric circuit, not particularly complicated, actually, with, with resistors and, and a few other kinds of impedances and currents. Now, the beautiful thing is that this circuit, uh, written like a set of uh, ordinary differential equation coupled together, give rise to chaos, give rise to attractors, give rise to different regimes, like the main uh, minima scenario Giuseppe was speaking about. So this simple representation without fields, without stochasticity, without anything uh, dangerous, uh, is already able to state, okay, the magnetosphere is not a trivial uh, object staying there and with, with no dynamics. So yes, of course. Okay, we have another question from Raul Melavio. Okay. Great presentation here. Thank you, presenter. Efforts have been made to understand dynamics for, for the various processes in the magnetosphere from nonlinear tools. How possible can we advance the prediction of those processes, such as the dynamic storm, EIA, etc., using nonlinear approach? Well, I, I would like to say that the answer mine is the following. Uh, we have many tools, like I, I feel like, okay, possibly I'm drunk, but I, I feel like uh, at the beginning of uh, quantum revolution, that is, uh, how could we advance in understanding why electrons uh, uh, don't behave uh, like, uh, you know, uh, balls of a billiard? Try this model, try this, uh, try Eisenberg's matrices, try uh, fun, uh, wave functions, try this, this, try that, and then human culture composes the, the, the full picture. We have different components, we have different tools, we are trying to put them together and do uh, what, what is probably necessary. I, I would like just to add a short sentence to what you said. If the problem is this one, uh, first of all, it's a matter of time scales. And the first point is uh, uh, at which time scale we would like to uh, uh, predict the response or the dynamics of such a thing. Okay. Uh, the second point is uh, okay. You, if we accept a certain time scale, we can uh, use some methods to to provide a forecasting of the uh, global evolution of these things. But uh, if you would like to to move to a shorter and shorter time scale when we have no control of the past dynamics, as I've shown before, the problem is that okay, probably. Um, we have to use an approach which is uh, uh, different uh, from the standard one, uh, which is much more similar to uh, the uh, meteorological uh, approaches, where you can we can say we can use a probabilistic approach. Okay, we have uh, let me say an ensemble dynamics, uh, so you can perturbate the dynamics uh, starting from your equations, and then uh, also nonlinear equations if we are uh, Capable of writing a simple nonlinear equation, you can try to to um, perturbate the initial condition to try to extrapolate the the dynamics uh, after a certain time. So you can just make a, a probabilistic description in terms of mean and uh, confidence limit of this. So this is something that we can do because we have no control and, and not enough capabilities to to uh, to follow uh, all the, the 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 variables that we have in this system, so the approach could be this one in terms of uh, probabilistic one, as you can find in uh, meteorological forecasting. And let's say tomorrow it will be with a five fifty percent of uh, uh, probability. This is the only thing that I can uh, see. Um, right now, so I don't believe that we will be able to have a deterministic prediction, but yeah. only a, a, a probability one. So this is a change, a way how we can change our mind. Also, because we have a, a, too many variables, 
sometimes, uh, as I shown you, we are in a critical state, so we don't know exactly what is the evolution, because a, a small details can influence all the system, the overall. And so this is my my. Thank you. Just to, you know, yeah. to finish the seminar, I, I thank you all again for the visit. Don't thank forget you. to my, my STI colleagues that do not accept the <laughs> complexity title, <laughs> and to those that are online, and also to Nicoleta, who is online. Thank you, Nicoleta, for being our host uh, on the remote. Thank you very much. Thank you.